If you have your Bibles, turn to Second Chronicles chapter 7. We'll be looking at this passage for the next two weeks. Thinking about a 2020 vision for the new year. Second Chronicles 7. I'm going to read verses 11 to 22. If you'll follow along in your Bible, if you don't have your Bible, we've got it on the screen for you. We think about this together. Thus, Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house, that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. As for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not lack a man to rule Israel. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I've given you. And this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house, which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, He has brought all this disaster on them. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord sharpen our focus today. Clarify our vision as we stand on the threshold of a new year. And may 2020 be the year we saw it clearly. 2020 be the year that the will of God came into crystal clear focus. We not only saw it, not only knew it, but we did it with all our hearts. Thank you. Please be seated. The year's 959 B.C. Solomon had spent six years building the temple and his royal palace. The temple's completed being dedicated. The Ark of the Covenant, that, that uh, symbol, there wasn't a symbol equal to it, that symbol of the presence of God. Aaron's rod that budded in there. The Ten Commandments in there. The Ark of the Covenant had been placed in the most holy place. Only the, only the high priest could go in there annually. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and sacrifice on behalf of the people. It's a new day. It's a new beginning. How do you match such a day? How do you meet such a day? Well, you pray. That's what Solomon did. He prayed. If you back up into chapter 6, which we're going to do in just a few minutes, what we're going to do this morning to set the stage for today and the next week is read Solomon's prayer. God has granted you and me a new year. We know people who passed away in 2019. We're not one of them by God's grace. He's granted us a new year. We stand here on the threshold. What are we going to do with it? It's a, it's a fascinating the year 2020. It has about it so many implications. Every one of us longs to have 2020 vision. I remember the day when I had 2020 vision. 
I don't have it anymore. 2020 vision is the ideal way to see. You can see the most things with the most clarity, with the most perception, with 2020 vision. And my prayer is that as we enter into this new year, God will bring into focus the very things we need to know about Him. That's why this study tonight, the attributes of God. Let me tell you something. If your livelihood, your energy to live for Christ and serve Christ and long to be around the people of God saved by Christ, if that has waned, I don't know any study that will get it back into focus like 15 attributes of God. If you want 2020 vision, you can watch this study at home on Right Now Media. We have it available to every one of you. It won't be the same as watching it together with, with us and having the discussion time. But you absolutely need to get in a new and fresh touch with the attributes of God. Otherwise, when you read where angels sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. When you read where things called, Worthy are you, O God. As next week when we read Revelation 5, worthy is the Lamb who is... Those words will run off you like water off a duck's back. But if you reconnect with who God is, then you reconnect with who you are. And you'll reconnect with who He's called you to be. Because He owns you. And He owns me. We are not our own. We're owned by the Creator who made us and sustains us. The Creator, children, every now and then I get you to do this little practice. So do it again with me. Adults, you can join in too. I want you to inhale, children. Now exhale. You did that by God's permission. You cannot do that on your own. We need to learn when we breathe as natural, we say it's as natural as breathing. And breathing is only natural as long as God gives the air the capacity, the heartbeat, the lungs. He's the creator and the sustainer. He made you, He takes care of you, He owns you. Oh, Reconnect some way, shape, or form with the attributes of God. We live in a culture that increasingly hates our God. And anyone they pick up a hint, look, Donald, Donald Trump is not a Christian, but Donald Trump shows at some level a moral reverence for God. And they hate him for it. And when they find out that you're a follower of Christ, they'll hate you too. We need to reconnect with who God is. We're giving that opportunity tonight. The attributes of God. I don't care who's in the playoffs. God's not going to be watching the playoffs. He's watching people engage in His attributes tonight. Well, I said I was going to read Solomon's prayer. It's a long prayer. Let's move through it, okay? What do you pray? when God has brought to pass the things He brought to pass in the temple. So we have something better than Solomon's temple. We have the Holy Spirit who's been given to us in the new birth so that Scripture says we are the temple of the living God. Listen in chapter 6, verse 1. Solomon said, The Lord has said that He would dwell in thick darkness. That's, that's our God. Thick darkness. When He would come down on the tabernacle, the Shekinah would come with Him. The presence of God. The amazing, astounding presence. Solomon says, I built a house, an exalted house for you to dwell in. And then he says this, verse 4, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with His hand has fulfilled what He promised with His mouth to David my father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there. And I chose no man as a prince over my people Israel. But I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there. And I have chosen David to be over my people. Well, David wanted to build the temple, remember? God said no. 
You're a bloody man. You're a man of war. He wasn't rebuking him. He just knew that he wanted his temple to be built by a man of peace. Shalomon. The name Shalomon. We say it's Solomon. Has within it shalom. Peace. And so Solomon talks about that. And then... He says in verse 14, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like You in heaven or on earth keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to Your servants who walk before You with all their heart. This connection is made throughout every page of the Scripture. Covenant faithfulness of God kept with people who are faithful to the covenant of God. He knows nothing of a relationship with any son of Adam or daughter of Eve who imagines that they're in covenant relationship with Him when they can dismiss His covenant responsibilities placed upon them. You see, everything He requires, the new birth enables us to do. That's the beauty of the new covenant. So Solomon acknowledges that. You've kept it with your servant David, my father. What you declared to him, you spoke with your mouth. With your hand, you fulfilled it this day. Solomon knew who had built that temple. Our former president said one time, you didn't build that. The answer of the people of God ought to be, well, the Lord built that and He was pleased to use my hands to build that. And the only thing that is good and that lasts is what the Lord builds. Everything else is coming to nothing. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David my father what you've promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel, if only your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk in my law as you've walked before me. Solomon did for a season. But it's sad if you know the history, the chronology. Nine years later, after this glorious day, almost a decade later, Israel begins to crumble. Two sons of Solomon. Two kingdoms. And it's tragic what happens. You see? If you continue to walk in my statutes. Now the good news is that this son who will sit eternally on David's throne was born in Bethlehem and has come. And he left the throne only to do the work God had given him to do. And he's on the throne now and he's not giving it up. And nobody can divide that kingdom. United Methodist Church looks like it's going to divide over gay marriage. The Southern Baptist Convention may yet come to the day when we divide over those kinds of issues. But I tell you, you cannot divide the kingdom ruled by Christ who sits on the throne. His kingdom is forever and ever and ever. So, now therefore, in verse 17, O Lord God, let Your Word be confirmed which You've spoken to your servant David. But will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? What a question. What an anticipation of the incarnation. Will God indeed dwell? We sing a song. Uh, is He worthy? We answer, yes. Does God intend to dwell? Yes. He asked that. Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and his plea. What's God going to regard in your, regard in your life this, this year? The prayer of your servant. O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you, that your eyes may be open day and night toward this house. Can you The implication of that, that God would shut His eyes upon this place. He would close His ears to this place. Solomon understands the implications of that. We encountered it just a few minutes ago when we read the text in chapter 7. The place where you have promised to set your name, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. And listen to the pleas of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. And listen from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes and swears his oath before your altar in this house, in other words, he repents, to make it right, then hear from heaven. This term, hear from heaven, hear in heaven, repeated seven times in this prayer. Hear from heaven. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. We are fools if we assume that because our mouths open and speak words that we call prayer, that God hears. And hear means, in this place, hear with a view to answering. He hears. Husbands are warned in 1 Peter 3.7. 
Treat your wives with respect as weaker vessels, joint heirs with the grace of life. Dwell with them with understanding, lest your prayers be hindered. Loose translation, lest God not hear your prayers. Then hear from heaven and act and judge your servants, repaying the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head, vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. If your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they've sinned against you, he anticipated that was a possibility. And they turn again and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house. Hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you, you gave to them and to their fathers. Folks, do you realize 959, neither captivity has happened at this point. First one in 722, second one in 586. Return them to the land you gave to their fathers. When heaven is shut up and there's no rain because they've sinned against you. See the connection he makes? We better make that connection. Our country is in trouble. Not because we have a political party that's gone completely insane, but because the people of God are not crying out. There's a little emblem in the corner of these slides. America prays. I'll be speaking more about that next week. We'll be joining that effort as a church. 24-7 intercessory prayer for the nation, for Oklahoma. When it's shut up and there's no rain because your people have sinned, if they pray toward this place and acknowledge your name, turn from their sin when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, when you teach them the good way in which they should walk. And we're not, we're not taught that just so we know about it. We're taught that in which we should walk. We endeavor to do that. And grant rain upon your land, which you've given to your people as an inheritance. If there's famine in the land, if there's pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if their enemies besiege them in the land at their gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man or by all your people, Israel, each knowing his own affliction, his own sorrow, stretching out his hands toward this house, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you, you only know the hearts of the children of mankind. That they may fear you and walk in your ways all the days that they live in the land that you gave to our fathers. You say, well, people don't fear God anymore. Are we praying? Are we praying? If we're not a praying people, if we don't recognize the value of that, individually and together, why would God do anything in this country except give it over? We don't have any inside track. America has none. And we're losing precious liberties that were, that were granted and taken for granted. Likewise, verse 32, when a foreigner who is not your people, Israel, comes from a far country, notice, not, not illegally crossing borders, but for the sake of your great name, and you're com coming here to participate in the exalting of the one true living God. And your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when He comes and prays toward this house, hear from heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel, that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. If your people go out to battle against their enemies by whatever way you shall send them and they pray to you toward this city that you've chosen and the house that I've built for your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to a land far or near, yet if they turn their heart to the land to which they've been carried captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity, saying, we've sinned and we've acted perversely and wickedly. That's where we need to start. If they repent with all their heart, with all their soul in the land of their captivity to which they were carried captive and pray toward their land which you gave to their fathers, the city that you've chosen and the house that I've built for your name, then hear from heaven your dwelling place their prayer and their pleas and maintain their cause and forgive your people who've sinned against you. Now, oh my God, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer of this place. He doesn't take it for granted. Oh, dear people, this year I need 
My home needs, your family needs, this church needs God's eyes open and His ears attentive to our prayers. Now, O God, arise, O Lord God, and go to your resting place, you in the ark of your might. Let your priests, O Lord, be clothed with salvation. Let your saints rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love for David, your servant. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now notice, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord. There they are standing outside the temple. They prepared the sacrifice. They've gotten everything in place. The Ark of the Covenant's in place. When Solomon finishes praying, do you think the Lord delighted in his prayer? Fire came down from heaven and filled the temple. We read in Isaiah 6, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. This is a manifestation of the glory of the Lord in this place. It consumes the sacrifice. So much so that the priests who were in charge of taking care of the sacrifice, of administering the sacrifice, could not approach. Brothers and sisters, Pentecost was a downpour like that in spiritual reality. We need something like a Pentecost in this place. We need the Lord to be so pleased with our intercessions, with our overwhelmed amazement of His attributes, of His love shown in Jesus, that He sends the Spirit in full measure upon this place, transforms us, consumes us, renew and afresh. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, it sounds very much like a psalm to me, for He is good and His steadfast love endures forever. Oh, people, we need that. I need that. You need that. 2020 cries out to us, a new day given by God. Put beside you, behind you, the distractions of the past. The business as usual. Complacent Christianity. Ease in Zion. Religion by convenience. No more! No more. You've promised us, Lord, if Your people who are called by Your name humble ourselves, which means we get, away, get rid of our agenda, we're not full of the pride of our own importance, our own priorities. We humble ourselves before the Lord. We're Yours. We're bought with a price. Glorify us, God, in our lives. Get glory to Yourself. If my people will humble themselves. My question to myself as I, as I look myself in the mirror this week, Bill, will you humble yourself before the Lord? No longer think that because you're a preacher, that you have some sort of inside pass because you're a preacher, you get certain exemptions. Will you, Bill Askell, humble yourself before the Lord? Will you, my brothers and sisters, will you humble yourself before the Lord or will you walk out of this place yawning saying, well, that was an interesting first message to the new year? Or will you humble yourself? Get down on the, your face before God, say, God, have mercy on me. Forgive me for tiptoeing through the tulips while this nation is going to hell. Forgive me. Strengthen me, Lord. And pray. And what kind of prayer? Not just going through the motions, pray. Seek my face. Prayer. Your face, oh God, we will seek if my people will recognize that business as usual paves the pathway to hell. And the promise, if they humble themselves and pray and seek His face 
which means you cannot look, you cannot seek the face of God without turning from our own wicked ways. And they may not be blatantly immoral ways, they're just ways that take priority over seeking the face of God. Turn from their wicked ways. Then, brothers and sisters, and only then will I hear from heaven. Do you want God to hear us this year? He's given us the prescription for it right here. If you don't believe you have the disease, you're not going to buy into the prescription. But if you believe you have the disease and you ignore the prescription, you doom yourself. But if you believe you have the disease, and you say, I see the prescription. And by God's grace, I'll take and press to my lips. I will forgive their sin, he says. I will heal their land. You and I live in a nation, the most blessed nation in the history of the world. And we have sinned grievously, greatly. And if we are complacent about this and go on about our way, nothing moves us, nothing stirs us, nothing grips us so as to interrupt our schedules, our calendars, our patterns, our habits, then I promise you, November 2020 will be the day that God drives the death nail into this nation. And you and I will lose liberties that will not be recovered in the lifetime of anyone sitting in this room. This is not a political speech. This is a spiritual reality. We have a spiritual battle going on in this country. And the enemies of our soul are marshaled and training and moving at every Term. If you haven't read rent, how to rent an evangelical, you need to read it. They've come into the church. I'll be preaching on this in the future. They're infiltrating the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the, in the name of the gospel above all, they're running all sorts of wickedness in place in the name of the gospel. Someone sent me a note this morning on my way to church. The vice president of one of the North American Mission Board's sin strategies has casino night at his church in Atlanta. Casino night. Craps tables, roulette, cards. So will you? Will you humble yourself? 2020. 2020, the year that I, I quit working God's agenda into my agenda. 2020, the year I say, God, I want to see. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. And in seeing, I want to do. I want your calendar to be my calendar. I don't want, I don't want my calendar to be yours. Your calendar. I want that to be what I operate off of. I'm not going to offer you mine and say, bless it. I want to say, bless me, Lord. Give me your calendar. I want to live on your calendar. If my people, all over this country, people are rising up to pray. I'll share with you next week the amazing things that are happening that God is doing. My question to you, Bethel, is are we going to get in on that? Are we going to watch it, wave at it, yawn at it as it goes by? Oh, I pray to God, starting with me, and He'll help me be more alert, more given to intercession this year, more focused on Him, following His prescription for what ails us than I've ever been in my life, but I pray the same for you individually and for you as a family. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in Jesus' name. And Oh God, this is not complicated. 
Forgive us, Lord, for trying to make it so, so mysterious. It's not. Oh, God. You've taught us. And Lord, You taught us the first thing is to humble ourselves. Lord, today I cast before You my agenda, my desires, my longings, my goals. And I say, Lord, give me Your agenda. Make Your desires that which causes my heart to beat. Your goals, the checklist that I operate from. Your calendar, that which leads in my steps. Forgive us, Lord, for chasing everything but Your glory. Forgive us for tipping our hats to Your holiness. Come, consume this place with fire from on high. A new, fresh, filled, strengthened to be Your people. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.